Many years ago, I'd say about 35 to 37 years ago, the sermon that I'm preaching today, I preached then, it was a long sermon. So I told the people in church that Sunday morning, I got a sermon I want to preach tonight. I says, but you need to understand ahead of time, it'll be right at three and a half hours long. I says that we will have a, a little break in between. And it was three and a half hours long. And somewhere around 77, 78, something like that, I was asked to come down to Florida Bible College and speak in not just chapel, but on a Wednesday night. Because <clears throat> I told Lee, I says, the message I have to bring is too long for chapel. Chapel was only 45 minutes. So I informed him that the message would probably be a, a minimum of three hours. I would try to cut it down. And so I um, cut it down to three hours. <laughs> this morning, the doors are locked. <laughs> but we will take a break to eat some food. But I have broken it down into four sermons. So this is page one. There will be four pages. One this morning, one tonight, one Wednesday night, and then the big one next Sunday. So I'd um, love for you to get all of it. Because with things that are going on in the world, you know, the thing about how many years they've been doing abortions, the things that are going on in government, even now that are terrible and people are losing so much. So many corrupt politicians and everything is just, it looks kind of dark. And the future don't look too bright down here as it is. So you say, what can we do? Well, one of the most important things anybody can ever do is learn this simple little thing called prayer. So this is called the principles of prayer, but you're actually seeing all the little scribbling that I did on it. Because I wanted you to have a copy of all my scribbled notes. I could have retyped it, but I chose not to. But some of the things that I have here, I think will be a benefit to you. And so I um, want you to start off with, you'll see right under my name there is Psalms 140, it's Psalms 139. So look in Psalms 139, and then you'll be able to follow right along with me as we go through these notes. And another thing that I want to mention to you is that as soon as we get through this morning, we're going to eat in the fellowship hall. This is our third Sunday dinner, and you are invited. This is the day that the pastor asked everybody to go out and eat with him. So isn't that wonderful? So you get to have a, a good meal. And I, I pray that you will stick around. You say, well, I didn't bring anything. You didn't have to. Don't worry about it. We, we have enough. So here in the book of Psalms 139, look in verse 23. This is what you want to be doing as we go through this so that you see if there's anything that needs to be corrected in your own life. Because if there's anything that can move the heart of God, it is prayer. Here in verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. Test me and see if I'm not real. And know my thoughts, my thoughts about God. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, the path of no end, the path of truth. So God wants each one of us to kind of look and examine ourselves. Now you'll notice on the top of the page I have about a boy in Minnesota. Well I had led some people to the Lord up in Minnesota. And then I have one, two boys in North Dakota. Well I went through North Dakota. Some of y'all have just heard about how cold it has gotten up in the, uh, in, the, in the frozen tundra. 
Well, I was going through North Dakota in freezing weather. It was about 70 below zero with the wind chill factor. That's nippy. I was driving a Volkswagen. I thought I was literally going to freeze to death. I was so cold. I had that Volkswagen wide open. The road was nothing but a sheet of ice. The wind was blowing. And I'm driving about 70 miles an hour on frozen ice. But I could handle the vehicle fairly well. Because I was trying to make some time. And I wanted to get to my destination before I ran out of gas. <laughs> Try that with a cop and see if it'll work. And so as I was booking along there, about one o'clock at night, I realized the gas stations were pretty far apart. In North Dakota, everything's far apart. And I saw a service station, I pulled in. And I walked inside, and there was these two boys standing there, and they didn't have anything to do at one o'clock in the morning. So I was so cold, I just jumped out and ran inside. He says, what can I do for you? He says, fill it up. So he goes out there. And Fills it up. Didn't take much to fill up that little Volkswagen. I just wanted to make sure I didn't run out of fuel. And they came back in, and he says, where are you from? I says, um, Colorado. He said, I knew it. I said, how do you know? He says, license plates. <laughs> he said, where you been? I says, oh, over in Minnesota, telling people how they could have eternal life beyond a shove it out by simply accepting the payment Jesus Christ made on the cross for them. And then I looked out to one and I could see the reflection of a clock behind me. And so I looked over at them. They were over by the cash register. says, in less than five minutes, both of you guys will know you have eternal life and know that you're going to heaven when you die. And so I looked out the window and drank me some coffee. And after about, you know, 30 seconds, the guy couldn't stand. He says, how do you know? I said, how do I know what? How do you know that we're supposed to know we're going to heaven in less than five minutes? I said, well, you really want to know? He said, yeah. Well, if you really want to know. So I pulled out my wallet and I explained the gospel to them. They both trusted Christ as Savior. They were so excited. But one thing that I had learned, I did not know always how to make the gospel clear, how to make it simple. But I had a heart's desire. I wanted to know. Because my biggest prayer that I have ever prayed to the Lord is I, I want to be used. However long you let me live, I want to be used. I don't care where, I don't care how. I just want to be used. And you can figure out the rest of it. And I was open to whatever the Lord had. It wasn't long before the ranch, even though we started with only two kids. Next thing you know, we were averaging about 450, but we had about 25 or so, trust the Lord, every Friday night, Thursday night. And we had high days of almost 50 people, trust the Lord. Now you're hearing about some of these teenagers going out and having, you know, 30, 40, 50 trust of Christ as Savior. It can happen. It's true. The biggest thing that I want is, Lord, help me to challenge people to reach people. I can't reach everybody, but I want to challenge somebody to do it. I may not shake the world, but I wouldn't mind shaking the person that shakes the world. And so you try to keep reaching people and create an environment where people who want to serve the Lord can find a ministry that can do it. So you pray for those things. We started a Christian school. And I sent some our teachers who has only been Sunday school teachers and a few graduates from college, Bible college. And so we started a Christian school. I had 19 kids. Half of them belonged to the parents, I mean the people that was going to teach. So we didn't have much money. And so I sent them down there to Pensacola. It wasn't long before they called me on the phone and said, Yankee, they said we have to have a principal. I said, you'll have one. And I uh, said, who? I said, don't you worry about it. You just stay there and get everybody ready to come home. They said, without a principal, you can't have a school. I said, you have a principal. So they hung up, and I sat in my office and said, Lord, I don't have a principal. Where am I going to find a principal? So it wasn't long before I got to talk to this one lady, and she had been a principal before. Her name was Beth Weeby. She came out. I liked her. She liked me. She liked what we were doing. I called the people back. I said, we got a principal. And she became the principal of our school. But sometimes you have to pray and believe. You trust. 
and all these things put together because I have a statement written here that you'll see in just a minute you can accomplish more through prayer than any other form of work you can work yourself to death and get nothing done but prayer is an important thing so look there at the next statement I have it in bold it's kind of choppy but it said if you are saved you have already prayed the greatest prayer in the world if you don't pray the sinner's prayer if you simply just said no Lord I believe that it's a mental Ascent to God. I believe that. I believe when Christ died, I believe he prayed for me. And just by that alone, what did you get? You got eternal life. You became a child of God. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You're going to heaven when you die. And all you had to do is agree with God that what Christ did was for you. And look what you received. Now, if you've already taken care of the most important thing in all of life... Think about all the other things you could have if you would only believe, only agree with God. So as you read and study the Bible, you're just coming to an agreement with God. Lord, I, I agree with you. I agree. I, so you don't try to get God to agree with you. It's you agreeing with him. You see, he doesn't uh, do anything wrong. He's already right. He's just getting us to where we come alongside. And Lord, I agree with you. And you learn how to start walking with the Lord. And you'd be surprised where God may lead you and how wonderful it can be. The statement that's written there, number one, do you really expect an answer to your prayers? I told people this. I says, like my wife going into the grocery store. She walks up to the manager. He says, may I help you? Yes. Well, what would you like? I, I want some groceries. You got a whole grocery store here. If you want, you can learn how to get something specific, not just in general. It's one thing to say, Lord, I want you to bless my life. And I want God to bless my life. But there are times when you might need something specific. And you have to say, Lord, I want this. So the woman goes to the shelf and says, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. And when you go to that store, why? Because you know they have what you need. We was on our way to a place last night, and Betty says, we got to stop at the store. So we stopped at the store, and she goes in there and got what she wanted. She didn't walk up to the manager and says, I, I need some groceries. Now, what do you want? So you learn. Look at the next statement, because it's so important. Number one is a scripture reference there in Matthew chapter 6, where he talks about, and they had mentioned to Christ, Lord, you know, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And he starts off with the one that you all know, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. And yet, a oh, one simple little prayer. And just about our daily bread. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't you want God's will to be done on earth in you to what God wants? And you walk in daily dependence upon the Lord. And you'd be surprised what God may do for you. And you want God to use you. And there's a lot of little details in between where the Holy Spirit that lives within you may guide you. You know, on a personal basis. But there's a, a walk with God that nobody can do for you. It's something that God wants you to do. And there's some wonderful verses here. And if you look straight across there, there's one in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, where he says, they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And then the one that's over there in James chapter 2 and verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, uh, where it says, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. It means you lost something that you could have had. You have not because you ask not. It means there's some things you could have had, but you didn't ask. You didn't do it. Who knows until we get to heaven, all that you could have had, you've already forfeited because you didn't even ask God for it. And God says, ask of me. Come to me. God wants to give things to his children. Look at the next statement, number two. Somebody said this about Charles Finney. Answered prayer is not a miracle. It is a law. 
He was told that he could pray down a revival. He says, nonsense. It is neither scriptural nor logical. Revival is not a reward sent in answer to my much praying. When I pray, I do not pray for revival. I pray for myself. I do not beg my heavenly Father for blessings as though he were death. I merely make my request known and then turn quickly the searchlight of prayer upon my own self. Prayer doesn't change God. It changes you. So that it is consistent for God to do what he wants to do anyway. Some of y'all might be wondering what in the world is this thing doing up here? It's a flashlight. But see, what you do is if I'm... I see a need and I shine a light upon that need. You're right here. And I take and go to the Lord and say, Lord, there's a problem and I want you to solve that problem. Well, understand, sometimes God simply wants you to turn the flashlight over and shine it on you. Now, how does God want to use me to solve that problem? Did you know that many things that God allows you to see. God means for you to do something about it. Sometimes we want somebody to do something. Somebody else do something about it. Remember whenever he says in Matthew chapter 9 that he saw the multitude and they, he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep having no shepherd. And he says to his disciples, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers. In the very next chapter, he sends them. The ones that were doing the praying is the one God used to answer the prayer. A lot of times you'll be surprised how that God may use you to solve the problem. But we always think we're just the pointer-outers of the problems. We just find all the dirt in everybody. But how many people do you try to help? lives you try to change because you got them sold upon God. You talk to them and you are able to, even with a mild, gentle, loving rebuke at times, or show them a scripture that helped them over a rough time. Some people think only about themselves. It's just always about me. And never remember they're supposed to serve, to minister to other people. So the next statement I have down here, it would be a miracle if God didn't answer. Because God, see, is working on getting things to do and get you to where he wants you to be. So that it is consistent for God to do what he wants to do anyway. See, there's things God wants done. But he wants a vessel that's yielded to him. And that person will yield to the Lord, God will be able to use that person to do what God already wanted to do. Look at number three there. There are basics to the mastery of answered prayer. Answers to a faithful child are not promises held out as rewards. John 3, 16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If I believe on Jesus Christ... Does God now have a choice whether to save me or not? Do I have to beg him to save me? Plead with him to save me? Or there's a possibility he won't save me? No. It would be a miracle if he didn't save me. If I believe on Christ, God must save me. It's a law. Based upon promises that he made, he gave his word and his word is law. For example, and I got a little example here. Water, you cool water to 32 degrees. If it turns to ice, is it a reward, a promise, or is it a law? It's a law. You mean it works even if the lost man gets some water to go to 32 degrees? It'll work for whoever it is, right? I told some people up in Minnesota, I says, I can walk on water. I says, I'll be back in January. I can walk on water. I just got to wait till it freezes over. But you see, it's, it's something. Let's see this here. Now, if I let go of this, what's going to happen to it? 
Now, it would be a miracle if it didn't fall, right? So, if I let go of it, it falls. Why? The law of gravity. So it's not oh, a miracle. No, that, that's not a miracle. That, that's a law of gravity. Did you know that God has laid down principles in his word? Principles that are almost like laws. That if you do this, this will happen. Sometimes we call it cause and effect. That for everything, there's a, an effect that is caused by something. And that everything has a tendency to stand still unless acted upon by an outside force. Now look what he says, what we have down here. In this little statement, at letter B, same with gravity. The laws of our body, you can violate the laws of physiology and there's consequences to pay. You can take a little arsenic and put it in your body. Mm, boy, that tastes good. But the consequences may be devastating. It could leave you totally dead. Kind of like I told you before about the preacher. He was so sick and tired of people in the church that he couldn't get them to straighten out. So he quit and went to work at a, a funeral home. So that at least now when he straightens them out, they stay that way. He says he's the one that put fun in funeral. That's over some of y'all's heads. I understand that. I know that. But 2 Chronicles 7, 14 talks about if, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and forsake their weary way and their wicked way, he says, and worship me and I will heal their land and so forth. Now, a lot of people take that verse and say, well, that applies to us. Now, you can apply it, but its primary application is to the nation of Israel. But they don't always seem to understand this. Not only if you call upon the Lord and ask the Lord, but he also says, and turn from your wicked ways. Did you realize that there's consequences to living a wicked life? And that certain things that are not right between husband and wife can hinder their prayers? If it hinders the prayers, it hinders the result of the prayer. And God says his ears are open unto the righteous. And there's some people that are double-minded. And so God says, think not that that man shall receive anything of the Lord. And even though God knows what you have need of before you asked, does not mean that you're going to get it. And that's why he says you have not because you ask not. So there are certain things, and just understand them. Let's say, for example, that I'm in God. I'm God. I'm up in heaven. And I have this uh, little trap door up here. And I open this trap door, and I've got all these blessings that are going to come down from that trap door. But the only thing is, though, is you're in the wrong spot. If I open them up here, you're not going to get them caught because you're back there. So God, in his wisdom may work in your life and get you to turn from your wicked ways and stop doing some of the things that you're doing. And he works and maneuvers, and he can only do that if you yield to him. If you don't yield and harden yourself and you don't move, then he can't get you where he wants you to be. Because he knows if he can get you here, he can open up that trap door and all these wonderful blessings will come down upon you. But no. You want to play hard to get, and hard nose, and be rebellious, and stiff-necked, and seek your own way, and you're struggling in things God would have given to you for free. And you want peace, and you want love, and you want joy. You want all these good things from God. And yet you're doing the things, and you're not where God wants you to be. You're not doing what God wants you to do. There's probably... Some of you here that may have known years ago, God wanted me to be a missionary, and you wouldn't do it. You should have went to Bible school, and you wouldn't do it. You could have been a preacher or an evangelist, and you wouldn't do it. You could have been a Sunday school teacher, and you didn't do it. You could have worked in Awana, and you wouldn't do it. You could have worked in, helped in the Reformers Unanimous, but you wouldn't do it. There's a lot of things you probably should have done, and you wouldn't do it. There's probably money that you had that you should have invested in the Lord's work, and you wouldn't do it. 
So God just taking it some other way. You'd be surprised how God will make you wish you had of. I don't have to be God, and I don't play God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But after a, a few years, I've, I've, I've noticed how he works. Remember, these here were 35 years ago. So I haven't changed it too much. I still go by pretty much the same things. I've not much that I've changed on these items because I believe it's the truth. And I believe that if, if it's truth, then it ought not, ought not change. So anyway, look at uh, where I have Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Then will I hear, then will I hear. So there's some things, and God says, when he says, I will hear, not just to hear it, means I'll answer the prayer. What is prayer? I've read Ari Torrey's book on power of prayer. I've read John R. Rice's book on answering, prayers asking and receiving. I've got about 10 books in there right beside each other. All of them have to do with prayer. All of them. And I read. And sometimes I read a whole book and get absolutely nothing out of it but one thought. And I read another book and I just... Most of it I already know, and it doesn't mean nothing, now, but I'll get one good thought. That one good thought was worth reading the whole book for. When I was up here with Dr. Lee Robertson, who was the pastor at that time of Highland Park Baptist Church and the president of the Tennessee Temple School, I'd go into his study, and he'd ask me to come in, and we'd sit there, and we'd talk a little bit. And he gave me a couple books and write some stuff in them. And those books, he says, now, there's a lot of good stuff in here. And he pointed to some of the, he says, no, I try to read about one book or two books every week. He says, most of them I don't get anything from. He says, but sometimes I get one thought. That one thought, I can develop a whole message. And that one message can change people's lives. All because I believe that God has taught other people things, and I'll read that whole book, and I'll get that one thought, and that one thought, build a sermon, that one sermon can affect people's lives, a thousand of them. All those people that he had in his day school and the night school and so forth, and there were over a thousand of them. And he was changing people's lives because he allowed somebody that he didn't know, reading a book who had a thought, worded it a certain way. I don't know if I told you this, but let me tell you anyway. I was over there in Israel with Ray Stanford. He was 85 years old. And so we were up there in Alexandria. We were down in Cairo, and we went to Alexandria. So late one night, I'm laying there in bed. Ray was over there. And um, somehow or other, I, I woke up, and I, I turned, and I looked over there. And I saw that there was a flashlight on under the covers. And he had a flashlight on under the covers and so I, I looked I said Ray he pulled the covers back and he looks at me I says what are you doing and he pulled the covers on back and he had his Bible and he had some note paper he said I didn't want to bother you none but I got to get a couple of thoughts down because i got to speak tomorrow. And the guy that got us over there, Dr. Farouk, says, you need to um, reword it a little bit better. It'll be easy for me to translate it. And so Ray was trying to figure out how to say I don't even know what it was. But here, at 85 years of age, over there in Alexandria, in the middle of the night, while I'm sleeping away, here's this old man underneath the covers with a flashlight, studying his Bible and writing some notes. And that next day when he spoke, you just won't believe the power that Ray Stanford was able to illuminate in that whole meeting. When he preached and he got through and he gave an invitation, it was hundreds that trusted Christ as Savior. I watched it from the platform, and Ray went down while they sung, and they sung, and they sung, and everybody was standing. And there was probably four or five hundred people that was in here, and, and then they had it outside. And Ray went row to row, and he shook hands. 
with everybody in there. He went up and down. And while he was doing that, everybody was applauding. This 85-year-old man that came all the way from the United States to tell them all about the Lord. And he made the gospel so clear and so simple. There was power in that man. Not just there was a man with a message. There was something a lot more important. Because he had a hunger and a desire to make the gospel clear and simple so that people could understand and trust the Lord. And nobody has to know exactly how much you pray and all that. But when you are prayerless, you are powerless. There is power in prayer. And so therefore, you and I are commanded in Scripture to cast our cares upon the Lord. That's a form of prayer. To humble yourself unto God. That's a form of prayer. Walking in dependence upon God, that's because you're talking to God. You're, you know you need God. And you want His desire. You want, you want Him to use you. And there's something that will be different about you. Look back there at the notes. Faith is a seed. You may have seeds, but have you ever planted? And learn how to play the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James chapter 5. And it means it would not have happened without prayer. If it avails much, it means something that would not have been done had you not prayed. I don't have to know what it is. But I believe that it is God's will for every one of God's children to pray and talk to the Lord. You should walk in an attitude of prayer all the time. Pray always. And be yielding to the Lord. Don't try to understand all about prayer. I don't even understand it all today. I just know that it's true and it's real. I had a young man that was doing his best. He was praying to the Lord to answer his prayer. Because he was a young man that had a desire to go to Colorado Bible College. But he had a couple of questions he had to have answered. And he needed answers right away because he was getting ready to get on an airplane and fly to Florida. I was talking to the kids there in a college class, personal evangelism class. And I told him, I says, I've got to bring a prayer request to you. I says, I, I appreciate it if you'd pray for me. I'm running out of time and I need an airline ticket to get to Florida. And I says, I, I just appreciate if you just pray, but I got to get going. And so I left the class a, little, a few minutes early. I went through the auditorium and about four or five kids followed me. Some of them never get the message. I turned and I said, oh, I don't have time to talk. I don't want to be unkind. I don't want to be rude. I says, but I can't talk to anybody right now. Thank you. And I turned and walked to my office. Here comes a couple of them. And I, knew, and I walked in my office and they walked right in behind me. Now. They better be thankful that I am a Christian, that I know the Lord and I love the Lord. Or I'd have slapped their jaws. But maybe not. They were both bigger than me. But anyway, these two guys, they walk in right behind me. And one was Rick Preshaw, and the other one was a guy named Dave Cannon. Rick Preshaw was a student. Here's Dave Cannon with him. He says, Yankee, can we just talk to you just for a minute? I said, Rick, I don't have time. I mean, what I said, I don't have time. I've got to hurry up and get this here thing done because I'm supposed to get on the plane. I've got to leave. He says, Yankee, just a minute. All right. They had been praying too. They had really been praying because Rick wanted this guy to stay for college. He wanted to, but he had a question. And so they, I stood there. I said, okay, what is it? He said, he wants to come to college but he asked me a couple of questions, and I answered the question. And so I says, well, did, did, did that help? It didn't take more than three or four minutes. He said, yeah, that helped. He said, I'm coming to college. He says, by the way, I have this ticket here. I'm not flying to Florida, so I don't need it. I says, where's it to? Right where I was going. He gave me his ticket, and I got on my plane. All of us were praying. I was praying. They were praying. But we were clashing. And awesome. And it met the need. And one day I came out of the class. I told the kids. I said, look. I have a $10,000 note due at the bank today. 
and I've got to get down to the bank quickly. And I said, I don't have any money. So I appreciate if y'all would just pray. And so I'm the president of the college, the great men of faith. And I started across the auditorium, and it happened again. Here they come. And I said, I, I don't have time to talk right now. I've I got to get down to the bank because I have to figure out what I'm going to do. And so they come more follow me. And I turned and I stopped them again. I went into my office, and this one college girl, she followed right in there. And I says, I, I don't have time to talk right now. She just said, how much do you need? I said, I need $10,000. She says, okay. I said, what are you doing? She says, I'm going to write you out a check for $10,000. I'm the president of the college, and I don't have $10, and she's got 10000 she can sit and write out to me. I says, Lord, something's wrong with this picture. I says, I can't give that back to you. She says, I didn't want it back. Give it here. She gave me the check, and I went down. I'm praying. I'm praying, Lord, how am I going to meet this need? How? What are you going to do? And the Lord said, I'm trying to help you. You'd be surprised. I've got stories to tell. I've got a track record. One man reached into his safe and he pulled out sixty-five, no, $70,000 cash and gave it to me one day. I said, I only need 60. And then I remembered, no, I need 70. So he gave me 70. And gave me cash. I walked out of his office with $70,000 cash. It's awesome. But just the things that have happened. It will build your faith. But the Bible says this is what we should do. Look very quickly down here. I'll probably never finish this, but you've got the notes here. What is a prayer of faith? Confidence that God will answer your prayers. If you trust Christ as your Savior, does God have a choice in saving you? No. When you understand and know the will of God, then you can pray and expect it. Is it God's will to use me? Yes, then I can pray for that. And no, he will answer my prayer. And he also has some that he has stipulations on, like meeting a certain condition. Yankee, I want you to purge yourself of this, this, and this, and this, that you may be a vessel fit for the master's use. And so I know that if I clean up my life, and I live the way God wants me to live, and I make the right decisions the way God wants me to, God has to to bless me. God has to use me. He doesn't have a choice. It's a law. If you dedicate your life to God, whatever it is, and you do right, God must bless you. He has to use you. He promised, and that's within His will. Now, He did not say that I'm going to give you a pink Cadillac, or I'm going to give you a million dollars in the bank. It all has to deal with the will of God. What does God want? And I want to enter into his will. I don't want God entering into mine. That's where we have a lot of conflict and things don't work out because, Lord, this is what I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Bless me, okay? And it doesn't work quite that way. Look down at the next statement. We can often bring more to pass by prayer than we can by any other form of work. Faith is trust in the honesty and the truth of another. Do you believe that God is honest and will do what he says he will do? If you believe that, then why wouldn't you pray? The next statement. Our trouble, we believe God can, but we don't believe God will. And then I have this underlined. Little is accomplished because little is expected. The Bible says in Psalm, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. Open thy mouth wide. What have you been asking for God lately? Ask him for something. Sometimes you have to be a little specific. What do you really want? And then trust that God's going to bring it to pass. I'm not the God. I don't have to guarantee anything. I'm just telling you what he said. I had a man tell me one time, who do you think you are? judging me, telling me I'm going to hell. I said, I'm just telling you what the judge said. I'm not judging. 
I'm not telling you anything. Except this is what God's Word says. Now you figure it out. What do you believe? I know Christ said over and over again. So he says, be it unto you according to your faith. Be it unto you according to you. See, a lot of people don't have any confidence in God at all. They don't believe Him. You may have trusted Him as your Savior because, you know, that doesn't depend on you. It just depends on you just trusting Christ as Savior. But our answer to prayers can also depend upon your obedience to God, your walk with God, your faithfulness to God. And that's what you're not sure of. Look down at the bottom of the page. Faith is not desire. Not how much you want something, but according to your faith, bid unto you. I may want money so bad for the church. That's a little statement I got over the side there. But wanting it is not necessarily going to get it. Like the preacher told his congregation, he says, got some good news and some bad news. Good news for our new building that we're going to build. We have all the money we need. The bad news, it's still in your pocket. Well, doggy, faith is not goodness. Answers to our prayer do not come because we feel like we deserve something. Lord, I deserve that million dollars. Lord, I, I went and I, I gambled and bought a ticket for the win the lottery. Oh, Lord, help me win that lottery. Somebody says, if somebody won the lottery and wanted to give the church some money, is that tainted money? I don't know. It might not be here. It, let's say it's, it's taint enough. <laughs> Look at the last statement on this page. Christ reprimanded the disciples because of their faithlessness. Because they failed to trust, failed to believe. You know, he says, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can remove mountains. Have you seen any mountain been moved lately? You know, a mountain sometimes in the scripture refers to, you know, just a big old problem. And sometimes it refers to a kingdom. But he did say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and teach in all nations. So it's possible that a person with a lot of faith can shake a kingdom by shaking a mountain. That's a nation by the gospel. How much do we believe? What do you want to accomplish? You really want to shake somebody, do something. Sometimes I feel like, man, I sometimes wish I was 30 years old again so I still have another 40 years to go. I look at it now and I think, eight more years, I'll be 80 years old. Whew, that's old. But when I get 79, I'll probably change my mind. It won't, it won't be so bad. Now, Al Marshall, now how old is Al Marshall? 85? And he's back there teaching Sunday school class. You said, well, I'm too old. Oh, really? He's 85, back there teaching Sunday school. And I went to Israel and Egypt with Ray Stanford at 85 years old. And then some people say, well, I'm just too old. You're just ready to shine. You finally learn something. It's kind of like having kids. When they finally get 18 years old and can get a good paying job and bring some money home, they leave. <laughs> and here you are. God has taught you so much for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And then you quit. It might be just the time. Remember in the Bible, the Bible talks about a guy named Caleb. 80 years old. And he says... I want that mountain. I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Esco grow. I want that mountain. Y'all ever heard that song before? How many of you have heard that song before? An 80-year-old man sung that song for the first time. And this is why it's so important. Don't lose heart. Don't get down and discouraged. You have at your disposal the greatest power of all. It's not money. It's not health. It's prayer. That's something you can do. Don't talk about what you can't do. Talk about what you can do. When's the last time you prayed for the preacher? Do you think I need prayer? 
you need to practice. <laughs> I need to pray and you need to practice. So you pray for me. Well, what about the, uh, the leaders here in the church? Do you think they need prayer? Do you think Jesse needs prayer? He's just doing a thumping a little bit over those teenagers. You don't have to pray for him because that's not very serious work. Try it. What about the Sunday school teachers? Do you pray for them? Do you pray for the radio ministry? The internet ministry? He said, well, I, I don't know what to pray for. I'm trying to help you. When's the last time you prayed for yourself? Pray for your family. Pray for your relatives. People that you know and love and have never trusted Christ as Savior. What have you done recently to reach them? Well, somebody will. Oh, yeah? Who? And how do you know? Maybe God wants to use you to answer your own prayers. I've had people say, pray that my husband gets saved. When's the last time you talked to him about the Lord? What about your kids? Do it. You'd be surprised what God will do for you. Look up here. I was, told, I was talking to James earlier, and James had, uh, had a good uh, RU meeting the other night, had a couple trust the Lord. Then he had to take some kid home. Bobby? I guess he took somebody home. And then uh, when he got there, there were some people standing around, so he got to lead a few more to the Lord. And then some other kids came by, and he led them to the Lord. And by the time he got through, he, had, he, he hauled in 11 that night. Isn't that awesome? And then he listened to Jesse, and they went out soul winning. And uh, what did he say, 40 trust the Lord or something like that? Is that right? Something like that? All right. But that would have happened anyway. If they hadn't gone, they'd have been saved anyway. Chapter and verse. No, it's because they did something. See, it's not just a matter of praying that people can hear the gospel. It's, okay, put some feet to your prayers. The church next door to Northside up there in Georgia was a, a beer joint. Not a beer joint, but it was a liquor store. And so they... Church was praying that it would burn down. It did. Somebody says, well, somebody had to put some feet to their prayers. And caused a little trouble. Because then the church had to promise them that there's no way God would have answered their prayer. Here you are. The most important decision you can ever make in your life is where are you going to go when you die? You mean all I have to do is agree with God on something? Yeah, agree with what God said. You don't have to do anything. Just agree with God. What do I doubt God agree with? Well, now look up here. This is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin. Will you agree with God that you are a sinner? Can you, agree? Can you, can you go that far? All right. You can agree with that. And everything you've heard is that God is perfect and righteous and holy in heaven and all that, you know. Can you agree with that? That God is perfect? Have you ever heard of him do anything wrong? God is perfect. He's righteous. All you're doing is agreeing. Now, this is the hard part. He says that you cannot save yourself. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot earn eternal life. Will you agree to that? You have to agree to this. You see, you can't get to heaven if you don't agree with this. Because, see, if you believe you, ha you can earn your way to heaven by your good deeds, then you're not listening to what God, God says. You can't. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. You have to agree to that. That you can't save yourself. That's why you need a Savior. And this hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, God in the flesh. Came into the world because he loves us. He took our sins and paid for it. And you have to agree to that. You have to agree. I agree. I believe he died and paid for my sins. He said he came back from the dead. And he can't save you if he didn't come back from the dead. You have to agree and trust him. Now see, there's not anything you have to do. You don't have to stop something or join something. All you've got to do is mentally agree with what God says. 
And he said, if you'll believe that he did it for you, he would put the payment he made to your account, and you can know that you're going to heaven. How do I know I'm going to heaven? Because God said, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Will you agree with that? If you agree with God on that, you can know you have eternal life, know that you're going to heaven. But see, believing what God says is just as faith. Believing what he said. Taking him at his word. The best news in all the world, and it's the simplest thing in all the world for a person to do. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed, and no one looking around. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to sign a card or give any money. It's a decision you need to make. Right now in the quietness of this moment, would you just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done things wrong. And I believe that when Christ died, he died for me. And I will trust him right now as my Savior. And friend, if you will do that, God said he would save you and give you eternal life. And if it's eternal life, it lasts forever. And if it lasts forever, all of your sins are paid. You're going to heaven when you die. That's the best news in the world. I'm going to ask you right now, in just a moment, to ask you to raise your hand if what I said made sense to you. It's just to let me know that what I said made sense to you. And you said, Preacher, that made sense to me. I want to be certain I'm going to heaven when I die. And so today, right now, I will accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, friend, I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. It's over and done when you trust the Lord right where you are. Is there anyone at all before we close? Just slip it up very quickly and put it right back down. Is there anyone at all? If you've already trusted Christ as your Savior, you're God's child. As a child of God, it is the will of God that his children talk to him. And he wants to talk to you. Learn to pray. Pray every day. Pray every day. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share these thoughts. And I pray, Lord, it be a blessing to each one here. And also, Father, we want to thank you for those that have prepared the food for us today so that we could enjoy it. You've been good to us. You've blessed us. We ask your blessing upon the food now in Christ's name we pray. Amen.